In the Stoudy family, they're bizarrely dying off, one after another. A husband dead of natural causes. There was no autopsy, no testing. He was cremated. The ashes were scattered at a lake. That was it. A son dead from seizures. And I'm like, oh my God, this mother must be devastated. She lost her husband, now she loses her, her son. A daughter hanging on to life in the ER with flu-like symptoms. It's That's bad. <laughs> okay. And she was as close to death as you could get. And a mother and wife, a devout church organist, left to shoulder the burden. Either this is a terribly unlucky family or something fishy happened here. But just how fishy? That's what police want to find out in a stunning interrogation. Oh, dear God. Tonight, piecing together the secrets in a highly unusual family, the tell-all diary. Their bedside reading. We had a book on poisonous plants. Their garage, always prepared for an emergency. Who has antifreeze in the summertime? and a very strange way of expressing sympathy. I didn't want another one to die in the house. And why is that? Because houses are nasty after somebody's died in it. So who's left in the family if they can survive long enough? Did you think somebody else was gonna be next? Talking on camera for the first time only to 2020, the daughter who did live to tell. I consider them as killers who hate me. What's wrong with these people? What were you thinking at that point? Oh, God, another one. <laughs> A family plot. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us this Saturday night. I'm Elizabeth Vargas. David is away. Get ready for something you rarely see outside a courtroom. All the detective work and the interviewing of suspects that goes into catching a killer. It is an investigation that 2020 worked on for two years. A bizarre family plot that culminates in the discovery of a secret diary. And this ominous line from it that says so much, only the quiet ones will be left. Here's Deborah Roberts. At the foothills of the Ozarks sits Branson, Missouri, the Las Vegas of the Midwest. Drive 45 miles north on old Route 66 and you're in Springfield, a tranquil college town where the buckle of the Bible Belt meets beer joints. Here on Page Street in a modest 900 square foot home, Diane Stoudy and husband Mark embody that unlikely mix of holy water and fire water. She's the church organist down at Redeemer Lutheran. He's the lead singer and guitarist of a local blues band, Messing with Destiny. You'll get the irony a little later. Together, the couple, former college sweethearts, are raising four kids in that small house. Six people, three small bedrooms, one bath. Tight quarters for what looks like a tight family. Did you get any sense of what their relationship was like? As far as I knew, Mark's life was great. Charles Alexander is Mark's close buddy and the drummer in the band. He was always happy with the kids. He was always happy with his wife. He loved them. He loved his family. And it was just a great family. Well, things aren't great for everyone. See, Diane isn't just praying in church. She's paying the bills at home. Okay, Mark picks up an occasional shift bartending, but Diane, a nurse, is the breadwinner. She seemed to be stable, ended up supporting him. He was the house husband standing open with the children. And if Mark was a laid-back Mr. Mom, the actual mom of the house was civil, if a bit standoffish. Was Diane friendly, warm? You know, she was friendly to the point that I can tolerate you being in my driveway. As the years wear on, life just keeps heaping more weight on Diane's slight shoulders, supporting her family in that cramped house and coping with some heavy challenges. Fourth grader Brianna has a learning disability. Sean has autism. And oldest daughter Sarah, a college grad, is still at home with no job and a mountain of student debt. But inside that Page Street pressure cooker, Diane's beloved child is blossoming. 22-year-old Rachel, a star student, this is the relationship that would forge the whole family's fate. She congratulated her every time Rachel had an accomplishment. When you look at it from the outside in, you think, 
That's a really close mother-daughter relationship, and isn't that great? Ron Davis with ABC affiliate KSPR-TV took us to the Stouty home. And what was it about Rachel that drew her mom to her so intensely, do you think? Uh, by all indications, Rachel is an exceptional human being. Very smart, very talented, artistic. On Facebook, Diane raves about her beloved Rachel, her art, her academics. But nary a mention for her husband, Mark, who in April of 2012 is finally having his moment in the spotlight. We had a good band. We were literally taking off. He's flying high, messing with Destiny as booking semi-regular gigs in Branson, joining the Aretha Franklin impersonators who get marquee billing. It's also Mark's birthday weekend. These are pictures from rehearsal that night where Charles notices that Mark isn't quite himself. What did you think was going on with him? He was just so out of whack. And it wasn't like he was drunk or anything. He was just out of whack. He wasn't with us. Then the next day, more odd behavior. He just showed up at my door one day, I mean, Saturday. And I said, Mark. And he goes, oh, I'm here to celebrate my birthday, Charles. Only one thing struck me so out of place, his skin color. What did it look like? Yellow. His skin was actually a, a yellowish color. So something was wrong with something him. Something was wrong with him. He's right. On Easter Sunday, Diane comes back from church and finds her husband dead in bed. I was devastated. I was devastated. Did you have any inkling that anything was wrong? Did you get any clue that Mark's health might have been bad? I mean, no. Yet Diane tells authorities her husband's been sick and refused to see a doctor. There's a curious ring of blood around Mark's mouth, but it's not enough to alarm the medical examiner, who rules the death due to natural causes. It was a bit of a shock, but I thought, well, you know, he doesn't really exercise, doesn't really cook, so probably not real healthy eating habits. There was no autopsy, there was no testing. He was cremated. His ashes were scattered at a lake. That was it. Diane organizes a memorial service at Redeemer Lutheran Church. What was that like? Well, that was, it was, it was sad. It was a sad event. The wife wanted us to do a song in his honor. So we played the song. Mark's favorite song, Darkest Hour. This is their audio recording from that day. As the family copes with Mark's sudden death, there's a small consolation, a $20,000 life insurance payout, enough for Diane to move the family to a new neighborhood and a larger home. They moved into this house right here. Oh, big difference. It definitely is. It's a step up from where they were. When we come back, the Stouties may have moved on up, but their bad fortunes are just beginning. The coroner's van was in their driveway. Because whatever afflicted Mark seems to run in the family. I said it was impossible. I was floored. And eventually, police will suggest a different diagnosis. My husband died last year of a heart attack. Did he? Stay with us. Twenty Twenty Saturday continues with more of a family plot. At Redeemer Lutheran Church, Pastor Jeff Sippy tends his flock with fervor and passion. We're jumping for Jesus. And, we're and in the summer of 2012, devout organist Diane Stoudy has good reason to lean on the pastor's sermons for strength. Then Mary arose and went with haste in the hill country. And so you can see a woman with a mission. Her husband, Mark, has recently died, and she's just moved with her four kids to this friendly street, hoping to put that sadness behind them. Rhonda Anderson, a church secretary, lives across the street. Did you see them going and coming? One day, the garage door was open, and I thought, I'm going to go over there and say hi. And just as I got over there, it was really like they looked at me and closed the garage door, really, because I, I could still see them standing there, so I don't think they wanted to talk to anybody. Rhonda doesn't take it personally, leaving her private neighbors to themselves. Until weeks later, one Sunday in September, she looks out the window and is shocked by what she sees. The coroner's van was in their driveway. 
a policeman said there was a death in the home. I was blown away. Once again, death has knocked on the Stouty's door. The firstborn child, Sean, gone at 26. Diane tells police he had flu-like symptoms for three weeks. Well, she reported she checked on him at about 6.30 in the morning, went to church, and then when she came back from church, found him not in bed anymore, but on the floor without a pulse. She explains that her son had a history of seizures, and though like his dad, Sean has an odd ring of blood around his mouth, it doesn't look suspicious. So the medical examiner, after an autopsy, decides that the second Stouty family death in six months is due to prior medical issues. They're thinking, wow, poor family. What bad luck? No one was asking questions. And nobody questioned that story? No even though her husband had died just months before. Yes. After police leave the scene, Rhonda walks over to check on her standoffish neighbor. Surprisingly, Diane answers the door. I said, we just saw the coroner's van was here. Are you OK? Is everything all right? And she said, oh, yeah, my son died. Was she distraught? No, she said it to me just like that. She said, my son died, very matter-of-factly. I just was shocked. Rhonda may be one of the few people Diane talks to about Sean's death. Because for him, there is no funeral, no memorial, not even an obituary. Like his father, Sean is quickly cremated. I'm like, oh my God, this, this mother must be devastated. She lost her husband, now she loses her, her son. Now only the stouty women are left. Diane, her darling Rachel, 12-year-old Brianna and Sarah living their secluded lives. I think they closed the doors even tighter because you didn't see them outside. I don't know how they even got their mail because we didn't see them at the mailbox. Then the following June, could it be true the Stouty plague strikes again? This time it's Sarah. Diane has seen this end badly before, so she takes her 24-year-old daughter to the emergency room. Sarah is sick goes to the hospital gravely ill. Sarah's in, in very grave condition. It does not appear that she is going to survive. Sarah's kidneys shut down, pancreas and other organs failing. Worst of all, her brain is hemorrhaging blood. Diane turns to Facebook, maybe hoping for divine intervention, asking for prayers as my daughter Sarah is in critical condition. Diane's brother-in-law, Michael Stouty, is floored by the post. Wow. It's like a lot of bad luck here in this family. What's going on? A good question. What is going on? 911, where is your emergency? Finally, someone in Springfield, someone claiming to be close to the family, calls in a tip to police, hinting that the pious church organist may harbor an unholy family secret. What did the caller say exactly? That Diane Stouty might be responsible for two or three homicides. Again, brought up Mark's death, Sean's death being very uh, close proximity to each other. Also spoke about the potential that Sarah was going to die as well. So the caller was essentially blowing the whistle on Diane Stouty. Correct, yes. Armed with that anonymous tip, Springfield Police Detective Neil McCamus begins investigating. He starts by pulling the reports on Mark and Sean's deaths. The uncanny similarities are stunning. Mark was experiencing flu-like symptoms for several days prior to his death. Same uh, type of description with Sean. Now we have Sarah that's also in the hospital with flu-like symptoms. Police are now connecting the dots. Then Detective McAmos visits the hospital where he gets more troubling news from Sarah's doctor. He had told me that they performed several tests. They couldn't figure out what was going on. And he said that he was uh, suspicious that there was, it was a possible poisoning case. So your radar goes up? Definitely. Police figure it's about time Diane Stouty answers some questions. She voluntarily comes to the station. And in interview room number three, Is it Stout? Stouty. One Stouty. of the strangest police interviews we've ever broadcast begins. Diane discusses Sarah's critical condition. I'm looking at the lab reports and it's like, you can't be living. Her kidneys were shot. She had a brain bleed. Her pancreas was acting up. Well, it's bad. Okay. <laughs> it, it's, I mean, she was this 
close to death as you could get. Her affect may seem strange, but remember, this is a woman dealing with great stress, emotionally and financially, and her family's crumbling one by one. My husband died last year of a heart attack. He had a lot of medical issues. Did he? So, yeah. What kind of stuff did he have? Oh, he had liver problems. He was diabetic. He wouldn't quit smoking. Do you have a son as well? No, not anymore. No, he no. died. He stopped breathing during one of his seizures. I've just never heard of anybody dying from a seizure before. Is that is that is it, that pretty it common? Happen. It can happen. And I'll be back there. Just the detective steps away, but when we come back. He does, too, to turn up the heat on the Merry Widow. There's been some things that have come up during the investigation. It's time to learn what's really going on behind closed doors at the Stouty home. I'm horrible. I'm a horrible mother. Stay with us. Twenty Twenty Saturday continues with more of a family plot. Over the course of 14 months, the quiet, God-fearing Stouty family seems as cursed as an Old Testament transgressor. Member after member inexplicably struck down. Mark Stouty, who fronted a blues band, and 26-year-old son Sean, both suddenly dead. 24-year-old Sarah lying in the ICU, her kidneys and brain failing. Now police want to know, is this a matter of bad luck or bad intentions? Which is why Diane Stoudy, wife, mom, and church organist, is sitting in the interrogation hot seat. Don't know what I can tell you. With cameras rolling, Detective McAmos asks about her marriage and for the first time glimpses a reservoir of resentment. We were still married, but it was not what you call a good marriage. <laughs> Have there been any infidelities on either side? He had. He was running around and he would drink and smoke pot and... So he wasn't a very good guy is what not, you're saying? Yeah. Even with all his faults, I still loved him. In this police interrogation video, Diane reveals cracks in the foundation of the Stouty home. Was there ever any physical abuse towards you? No. Nothing like that? I mean, I, I didn't think it was that bad that my kids would probably say otherwise. Mm -hmm. I wasn't happy. <laughs> okay. Now watch as he deploys a classic interrogation technique, shifting from inquisitor to sympathizer. I'm a believer myself, so I understand where you're coming from on that. He tells Diane sometimes even the righteous reach a breaking point. So what happened with Sarah? As far as did I do something to her, I didn't do anything to her. I mean, I, I guess I could have taken her to the ER sooner, but I didn't know. A major reveal. Diane may have delayed taking her daughter to the hospital. That was just kind of where her story uh, started to crumble. But I'm horrible. I'm a horrible mother. Then a suggestion that Sean may have been suicidal. But again, she admits she did nothing to help. He had been threatening to kill himself. I'm such a crummy person. Now is your chance to, to tell us why and, and to show some remorse and ask for forgiveness. And then she drops a bomb. Put it really short and sweet. I knew they were drinking antifreeze. Drinking antifreeze? And I was so mad at him. I didn't want to take him in. You knew, Diane, that they were drinking antifreeze because you were giving it to them. I didn't know what else to do. I really didn't. And there it is. After two hours in the box, Diane Stouty quietly confessing to poisoning her own children with antifreeze. This is a woman who's admitting that she killed her son and tried to kill her own daughter. What are you making of this? I was just totally astonished, to be honest. Uh, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. There were times I didn't know what to say or, or how to react. How long had you been giving them the antifreeze? Maybe a couple of days. And what were you putting it in? Coca-Cola. How much would you put in? A couple of teaspoons, maybe. 
But why antifreeze? She explains that it's easy to get and easy to disguise. The main ingredient, ethylene glycol, a colorless, odorless, sweet-tasting, and deadly chemical. Killing someone with antifreeze is a classic way to try to mask what you're doing. It takes time, it's relatively flavorless, and there are no immediate signs after death unless you're looking for it. Now it's all pouring out a full-blown confession. Diane admitting she poisoned her husband Mark the exact same way, spiking his Gatorade with antifreeze. Apparently, she'd had it with a husband she considered an abusive deadbeat. By then, I hated his guts. He would throw things at me. He would throw things at the kids. And I guess I just had enough. Killing her husband's awful enough, but a mother poisoning her own children? This mom's motive is downright chilling. Both Sean and Sarah would just basically, I don't know, trash the house and never helped support or even contribute. Sean would be interfering with whatever I would do. So if he was just a constant bother, wouldn't leave you alone? Oh, he was more than a bother. Would a pest, would that be a good word for it? It was more than that. My husband got on my nerves. I couldn't stand him. And my son, you know, was a pest. I mean, did she seem like at her wits end? No, she, again, throughout, she stayed flat. Even when, this, when she's telling me that information, she, uh, she, you know, she seemed unfazed. Yep, unfazed, even by the ultimate kicker, why she poisoned her daughter. And then with Sarah, you talked about, you know, she, she wasn't getting a job, and then she had these student loans, and you were going to end up having to pay for them. It's pretty much And you just had had it with her as well. I'm not a perpetual killer. I'm just stupid. I regret doing it. I really do. I, I've, I've screwed up everybody. I've screwed up my whole family. But it's too late. Here come the steel bracelets. Right now, you're going to be under arrest. Case closed? Not by a long shot. See, police are about to search the Stouty home and will find a purple diary with some very purple prose. This is a key piece of evidence. It will prove that Diane had a partner and eyes on another target in these horror movie homicides. <laughs> Next. Twenty Twenty Saturday continues. As the freight trains roll through Springfield, Missouri, the wheels of justice are turning slowly too. Police are interviewing 22-year-old Rachel Stoudy, a star student, gifted musician and artist, her mom's pride and joy. Mom was there every step of the way, really encouraging and cheerleading Rachel to be great. But now her dearest mommy, Diane Stoudy, is behind bars after confessing to the poisoning deaths of her husband and son and the attempted murder of Rachel's older sister. Hey, Rachel, Hi. can I get you the switch with me? Okay. Oh. Police just hit Rachel with the news. Confusion, shock. I mean, that's... Nobody expects to have somebody that they know do that. <laughs> In this interrogation tape obtained by 2020, Detective McAmos lays it all out. Demure Diane has delicately engineered a ruthless culling of her own herd. Only the pious and the productive will make the cut. Did you think somebody else was going to be next? Sarah can be poisoned just for sitting around on YouTube. I don't do anything around the house. Brianna sure as heck doesn't do anything around the house. Rachel fesses up that her mom had some unusual reading material. We had a book on poisonous plants. I mean, she would talk about cyanide. Mm -hmm. Then a critical moment across town. Crime scene investigators are busy combing through the Stouty home. These pictures show a house in disarray. This was the home, the, the second residence. Detective McAmos gave us a tour inside with permission from the new homeowner. This was Sarah's room. There were some couches, there were papers, just kind of things strewn about. She kind of had an office space set up. You could see there were some computers. Laptops, flash drives, sculptures scattered about. And in the garage, pay dirt. This is where our crime scene detectives located the antifreeze on the workbench. 
and right next to the antifreeze, the other compound in Diane's cruel chemistry, an otherwise unassuming six-pack of Coke. Coke was described as what was given to both Sean and Sarah in terms of poisoning them. The concoction right there. Yes, The correct. Coke and the antifreeze. In the bedroom, a curious detective makes that dynamite discovery. This is Rachel's purple diary, haphazardly thrown on a shelf. Its contents a trove of sinister secrets. It appeared to be in a journal entry written by Rachel, knowing that uh, Mark and Sean were getting ready to be killed. So at first, you're thinking this is a, a mother, an evil mother, who's tried to wipe out her family. And now you discover her daughter might be involved helping her? Yes. That journal entry dated June 13th, 2011, nearly a year before Mark died. It reads, It's sad when I realize how my father will pass on in the next two months. Sean, my brother, will move on shortly after. It will be tough getting used to the changes, but everything will work out. That's pretty chilling. Very. She's writing in a journal about killing her father and her brother. It was extremely alarming. I'm going to have you wait here for just a second. Back at the station, Detective McAmis leaves the room and gets briefed on that explosive diary. He returns in a different mood. Rachel, do you recognize this? Yeah, I remember this. This is Missouri, and now it's time to show me. You wrote this then, what you're telling me? Okay. I've had a lot of really bad dreams about them dying. I talked to mom about it, and she mentioned she was thinking of hurting them. Rachel's bad dream just beginning. McCamus isn't buying her story or her tears. <sighs> what did you tell your mother? That it would be quick. That it'd be easy. <laughs> Rachel reveals the awful truth. Mother's favorite was also mother's little helper. When did you guys come up with this plan? I mean, we talked about it, like, Christmas. She's sitting right here. She's starting to tell you the whole thing, and she basically owns up to it. To hear the daughter and the admissions that she's making and that this was a plan, and I was totally shocked, totally stunned by, by everything that had taken place. It was just a completely surreal feeling. The mother-daughter duo carefully plan and research all options. Suffocation, pills, Googling how to kill your husband. The devout Christians even explored witchcraft. Like on my computer specifically, there's a lot of Wicca sites. Before settling on antifreeze. Because in general, you could put it in something and you couldn't taste it. What else did she tell you? She wanted a specific tasteless one. Rachel, whose idea was this? Mom brought it up I mean, and then we discussed. Mom recruiting daughter to help her systematically kill her husband, her son, and then poison her daughter? It's almost on her. It was supposed to be just dad, but pretty soon Diane turned her attention to Sean, the son she thought was irritating. Listen to how little it took to end up on her hit list. Sean, we argued on a lot, because I still think we could have put him in like a assisted living, but she wanted him out. What did you say when she talked about killing Sarah? Sarah was equally unneeded. We could have found someplace else for her. She was very adamant on that Sarah was just a burden that Sarah needed to be taken care of. Rachel, too, now under arrest, charged with murdering her father and brother. Her sister Sarah still fighting for her life. When Rachel was arrested, there was a big clue. Found in her That's purse. right, her purse was searched, incident to arrest, and there was a note. With her sister Sarah hospitalized, the star student Rachel had authored a poem worthy of Edgar Allan Poe. Once upon a time, there were six. Now, there are three. Only the quiet ones will be left. My mom, my little sister, and me. Wow. That's pretty cold stuff. This is a very cold and depraved murder. The Springfield poisoning case. Two people dead, two in jail, one in the hospital. The family was poisoned with antifreeze. The next day, the tale hits the news like a twister. While down at the county courthouse, a rare sight. A mother and daughter both arraigned for murder. No way. This cannot be true. 
not right here in our little neighborhood. But no one is more surprised than Mark's old bandmate, Charles Alexander. I was floored. And when I heard that he was poisoned, then I just cried. I collapsed. I said, I can't believe this woman did this. Looking back, he begins recalling little quirks about his friend's wife. I was never really allowed in the house for some strange reason. It was always at the garage. And it was so strange. I seen the antifreeze bottles sitting in the garage, and I'm thinking, who has antifreeze in the summertime? Strangest of all, Diane's blasé manner after Mark died. I went to her house and asked her what happened. And she proceeded to tell me like she was giving me a recipe to a cake. No emotions, no nothing. Just matter of fact. It was just like, oh, he died and you had, and you had two eggs. Also shocked, Diane's fellow church members at Redeemer Lutheran. Well, maybe except for one. Remember that anonymous 911 caller who first tipped off police? Do you ever find out who blew the whistle on her? We were able to determine uh, that the anonymous caller was actually the pastor at Diane's church. The pastor turned her in? Yes. Pastor Jeff Sippy. If you are not praying for your children, if you are not deeply invested in them, I'm going to tell you this, no one else is either. The leader of the flock compelled by his own conscience to root out the wolf among them. He declined our requests for an interview. So he knew that something was evil here. I think he definitely had his suspicions. Diane's demeanor um, after the deaths, he told me he couldn't take those feelings that he had to, uh, he had to call it in. When we come back, two Stouties in jail awaiting trial, two Stouties dead and a third in ICU. But this one regains consciousness and lives to tell. Did she suspect that her soda was spiked? So you read in her journal she was trying to kill you? She tells her story only to 2020 next. <laughs> 2020 Saturday continues with more of a family plot. You're looking at a woman who defied all the odds and lived to tell, surviving a vicious poisoning. Well, this is where I sleep. 24-year-old Sarah Stoudy has had to relearn to walk and talk. I'm right here. Her speech still stunted from the irreversible brain damage she suffered. Tonight, for the first time, she's speaking out about the horror and betrayal. Sarah lost her father, Mark, suddenly in 2012, and her brother, Sean, just five months later. You found him dead. Yes. That must have been horrifying. Traumatizing and more traumatizing, learning that her mom, Diane, was not her protector, but a predator, poisoning them all with antifreeze. And the icing on the cake, her younger sister, Rachel, was part of the plot. But I was asking, why? Why did my mom and sister kill my dad and brother and harmed me? Did you believe it, or did you sort of assume this can't be true? I assumed that it wasn't true. They were innocent people being blamed. But any trace of sympathy evaporates after Sarah reads in the newspaper why her mother poisoned three family members. She simply despised them. They really planned this heinous crime. I was shocked. I just felt like I wanted to strangle my mom because of what she did. The big question, why did Diane bother to rush Sarah to the hospital after leaving her son and husband to die at home? In a follow-up interview with a clearly rattled Rachel at the Greene County Jail, Detective McGamus wants to know. When Sarah got so bad, why did you take her to the hospital? Was it some last-minute tug of Christian conscience? Apparently, no. I didn't want another one to die in the house. And why is that? Because houses are nasty after somebody's died in it. I get a lot of nightmares. But what Rachel tells police next may be the most heinous of all. She and Mom Diane weren't exactly finished. Brianna, is she next? When were you guys going to kill Brianna? Sometime after Sarah. Brianna, the youngest member of the Stouty clan, a tender 12 years old. Too young to drive, but old enough to drink her mother's poison, antifreeze, in her root beer. They were going to kill the little girl as well? 12-year-old girl. What's wrong with these people? And what was the reason for Brianna? Because I know there's no way in hell I'd be able to take care of her. 
I can't take care of me. So how could I ever take care of her? She had described uh, Brianna as a burden. They didn't want around the house. That was her explanation. Four people, they would have killed four people in this house if they could have? Correct. Rachel said that her mother was the only one that understood her. They could relate to each other and it was just gonna be those two. Do you think this was just a case of a mom and daughter who just in some sick way wanted to have a simpler life? I don't think that there's going to be any acceptable, remotely rational explanation. The question is, how could this have possibly happened? Did the police blow this thing? Could they have prevented Sarah's poisoning by connecting these dots? I think it's easy to go back now, and there was nothing at that point to indicate anything malicious. Neither one of them knew about the, the other deaths. But what about the medical examiner's office, who critics say bungled the bodies of Mark and Sean by missing obvious signs of foul play? They defend their work on the case. When you have physical findings at the autopsy that match the story that was given, typically other organs aren't looked at microscopically saying antifreeze is difficult to detect unless you're looking for it. Later tests did confirm that Sean's body had the presence of that killer chemical, ethylene glycol, found in antifreeze. That news came a bit late for Sarah. Still, she's learned to accept her new reality, living in an assisted care facility, more alone than ever. Do you still consider them family? Not anymore. I consider them as killers who hate me. You're angry. I just felt like I want to slap both of them and calling them B-words. Their family plot uncovered, perhaps it's no surprise that mother-daughter murderers would eventually turn on each other. And sure enough, Rachel made a last-ditch effort to save herself with a plea deal. Reaction to a guilty plea from Rachel Stowney, the Springfield woman charged with poisoning three of her family members. Throwing her mom under the bus. That's crucial. The fact that her daughter has pled guilty, seems ready to testify, could in and of itself be enough to convict her and potentially send her to death row. When we come back, Diane Stoudy in court. And for the first time, the daughter she poisoned coming face to face with her sister and mommy dearest. And what would you say to Rachel and to your mom? Stay with us. One twenty Saturday continues. Judgment day for Diane Stoudy. She enters the courtroom, her back against the wall, facing death by lethal injection. But then... You intend to enter a plea of guilty in this case? Yes. Pleading guilty to killing her husband and son. Sentenced to life in prison without parole. Also in court, in the front row, the daughter she tried to kill, 24-year-old Sarah, facing her mom who poisoned her with antifreeze. I'd rather be a survivor than a victim. She not only took away my dad and brother, but she took away my, my independence. Callous to the end, Diane never bothering to look at her damaged daughter. Yet weeks later, when it's Rachel's turn to be sentenced, she dissolves into tears, reading a statement to her sister. I'm sorry that I couldn't find the courage to stand up for what was right. Your suffering could have been prevented. And I hate myself for not being there for you. And yet for all the pain and loss, today Sarah says she harbors no ill will. I forgive my mom. 